Open door, open heart. Hi guys, I'm Jill. I'm the volunteer and foster coordinator here at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. Thank you so much for joining our dog TLC team. We have volunteers coming in daily, multiple times a day, to spend hands-on time with the dogs in our care. This helps to decrease any stress they have here at the shelter and enrich their time with us. Here at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter, we use science-based behavior modification and training for all the animals in our care. This means that we are working off evidence-based scientific models. Um, we also utilize LEMA, or at least intrusive, minimally evasive handling. This allows us to reward behaviors we like and ignore behaviors we don't like and keep from adding any added stress to their animals during their shelter stay. When you're a volunteer, you're here to socialize with the animals as well as be a mentor for the other volunteers here. Um, you're also a representative of the shelter to the public. So you could be helping do adoption shows or simply just providing information about our services and things that we offer to the community. During your time here, we ask that you have a two hour commitment per week. This allows for volunteers to volunteer regularly and keep up to date with the protocols and procedures, as well as commit to a certain shift. We understand that everyone's schedule varies and you don't need to commit to the same shift every week but two hours per week is the general rule of thumb. There are three different types of dog TLC shifts that you can participate in here at the shelter. We have dawn patrol, so that is the first shift of the day and it starts at 7 a.m. The goal of this shift is to take dogs out and get them out for their first potty break. We focused on the housebroken dogs first and then move on to the other dogs. Um, the shift, you are moving rapidly through the dogs to take them out to potty and then circling back to spend longer amounts of time with them. During the middle of the day, we also have shifts where it may be more focused on enriching their time here at the shelter, taking them on walks around the neighborhood, playing fetch in the yard, snuggling up and brushing them. Um, that's kind of where this, this shift falls. Our last shift of the day is called Dusk Patrol. This is very similar to Dawn Patrol, but it's ending the day and allowing the dogs to have their last potty break and their last like fun in the yard. Um, all of the shifts are equally important and help the dogs during their stay here. Outside of my office, um, along the hallway, there is a big board. This is what we call the volunteer hub or the dog TLC board. Um, here is where we'll notate medical and behavioral concerns that are notated by staff or observations by volunteers. This is a great place to check in when you're starting your shift to see what's going on with the dogs in the shelter. If someone's having an upset stomach, if someone is a little jumpy mouthy because they're getting stressed out in the kennel. So this is a great place to check in and also check out and note any observations that you made during your stay at the shelter. There also are two different tiers of dogs and volunteers. So we have what's called tier one. So that will be notated on the kennels by a blue lock. And there is a tier one set of keys for tier one volunteers. Tier one dogs are easy dogs that do not have any behavior concern that needs further training by the person handling them. These are dogs that walk relatively nicely on leash, aren't causing a huge ruckus when they're exiting or entering their kennel, um, and are just relatively easy to spend time with while they're at the shelter. On the other hand, we have tier two dogs. These dogs are equally great, but they may have some behavior challenges that we're working with during their stay at the shelter. Sometimes these dogs can be jumpy mouthy, reactive to other dogs, or just working on some life skills and manners. These dogs will have a yellow lock on their kennel, and they will also have a um, tier two set of keys. The tier two set of keys has two keys on them. One is for the blue locks of tier one, and one, the other is for the yellow locks for tier two. If you are a tier one volunteer, you should only be having a set of keys that has one key on them. If you're a tier two volunteer, your set of keys will have two keys on them. 
Dogs that cannot go out with volunteers are called red dog dogs or staff only dogs. These dogs may not be able to go out with volunteers for a medical or behavior reason. During their time here, they're taken out at least three times a day with staff who are trained to work with the individual dog. Most often, these dogs are not taken out by volunteers due to behavior reasons. It could be a fear-based behavior or some sort of behavior history that we need to observe. If there is no dotage or no signs on the dog's kennels indicating if they are a tier one or tier two dog, we ask that you do not take that dog out. That dog might have just come into the shelter and staff are still working on identifying what the next best step is for them. When you're first starting to volunteer as a dog TLC volunteer, you will be a tier one volunteer. Tier two volunteers require a little bit more experience with the ins and outs of the shelter and as well as some additional training. We certainly would love for you to work up to that, but it's not a thing that every volunteer needs to be a part of. If you wanna just be a tier one volunteer, that's totally okay. If you wanna to work towards tier two, come and talk with me. We can work and get you um, started with that. If you are a parent and child team or a client aid team, you are only allowed to handle tier one dogs. This is for your safety as well as the safety of the dogs. After this training, you will go on to your mentor training. This will be when you're working one-on-one -on -one with an experienced volunteer or a mentor who will show you the ins and outs of working hands-on with the dogs here at the shelter. This mentor training takes between an hour and two hours. If you don't get everything in the first mentor training, that's okay, we can set up another one for you. All right, while you're here volunteering, there is an attire, and this is to keep you safe and healthy during your time here at the shelter. You're going to wanna to wear closed-toed shoes that are rather secure and have good traction, like sneakers. Um, you're also going to wanna to wear a pant that covers the majority of your leg. You'll also be wearing an apron. This will be provided for you during your first mentor shift. You'll also wear a shirt that covers your midriff. Um, a, for dog TLC, you'll have a slip lead and you can wear it over your shoulders while you're not actively using it with ease. Some of the supplies you'll carry in your apron pockets are treats for dogs. So you can have big treats and then break it into tiny little pieces to give the dogs. Some other supplies are poop bags. These are great for when you're in the yard or out on walks. We ask that you have your volunteer keys on you to get in and out of the kennel. These will be left at the volunteer station and you'll trade them for your car keys. Another thing to have on you is a cell phone. The cell phone is not to be utilized to chat with friends or do work while you're here. It is for emergencies only, so make sure you have our shelter number in your phone. You also can capture cute videos and photos and send it to our shelter Instagram or Facebook for promotion for the animals. Another item that you can have is a mask. So during times of COVID in 2020, we have a mask to keep everyone nice and safe. So make sure you have this when you're volunteering. All right, I'm gonna show you guys where our supply closet is. So if you wanna follow me. We have our supplies for dog TLC in this closet. It is a nice double door that you can open up. Most of the time staff will have fit any dogs for harnesses and leashes, um, collars, but if you do need supplies, they are here. So we have various harnesses, leashes, collars, and adopt me vests here that you guys can utilize. Another great spot where you can find supplies during dog TLC is right here at the volunteer station. Um, so under here in this cabinet, we will have a variety of treats. So volunteers can bring their own treats, but we also supply them here at the shelter. You'll also find poop bags here. So many different poop bags. If you wanna donate any of these supplies during your time volunteering, that is very appreciated, but we also wanna supply it here for you. guys I'm gonna show you guys how to use the slip lead so we use these here for all the dog volunteers to take out dogs out of their kennel 
This is the best leash to accommodate a variety of size dogs because it closes and opens depending on the dog's size of their neck. This is not a leash that we want to use walking dogs around town as it's not as sturdy and comfortable as a harness setup would be for walking a dog. Um, when you use a slip lead, you'll see there's a stopper here and this will help to keep the slip lead on the dog's neck. Um, but when you go to loop a dog's in the slip lead, you're going to hold it up in here, put it over the dog's neck, and it will close with tension. So then you can walk the dog or have them sit like natives. <laughs> when the dog's leash is on, you can pull the stopper down to the dog's neck so that you can drop the leash and the leash is secure on the dog as it's moving around the yard. You then can pull the stopper back up here and take the leash off the dog and move on to the next one. This is a clip collar. This is the most common dog collar you'll see out in the world. So it has a buckle here that clasps and opens and then just a simple mechanism that makes it bigger and smaller here. Um, we do sometimes use these along with martingales, which I'll show you next here at the shelter. For a clip collar, when putting it on a dog, you will clip it on and you will notate if it's fitted correctly by if you can take two fingers to slip under the collar and turn sideways. If the collar's too big, then you should be able to pull the collar way too far away from the dog's neck. If it fits appropriately, then you'll just have enough room to turn your fingers and then put them flat again against the dog's neck. Sometimes people will think the collar is too tight, but that is how it's supposed to be properly fitted to make sure they can't slip out of it. All right, this is a martingale collar. This is the most common collar we use on shelter dogs. The simple reason is, is that it has this thing called an active loop, and this prevents dogs from slipping out of the collar. A lot of shelter dogs are stressed while they're here in this environment. And so having a um, collar that's nice and secure and prevents them from running away is key. This martingale collar has a clip that will open it back up. Some martingales do not have a clip and simply just slip over the dog's head. <laughs> this martingale is fit to this dog and I'll show you how we'll put it on. So we will clip it here and you will see that the active loop when pulled cannot pull the dog, the collar over the dog's head. But when not activated, it still has plenty of room and can typically be pulled over the dog's head without unclipping. That is kind of the nice thing about martingales too and why I use it on my personal pet is that it's not super tight around the neck when they're relaxing, but it is nice and safe to use when out on a walk. This is an Easy Walk. It is one of the front clip harnesses we utilize here at the shelter. Easy Walks are great because they di divert a dog from pulling um, just due to simple force and um, very minimal pressure. This Easy Walk is stretched out as big as it can be. And I'm gonna show you how to fit it on Nate here. So this odd color, so the black strap here, is the strap that's gonna go under his belly. The other two straps will go over his head when I'm fitting it. So put it over his head here. And you see that this is now very large. Um, the first step will be to tighten the shoulder strap. You want it to generally sit right behind their shoulder blades here. You then want to tighten this front strap a little bit. And then you can kind of mess with it. Um, you can put the strap on underneath. You can see here that when it's on, <laughs> you'll notice that it is right behind his shoulder blades and it makes a T shape. That is the shape that you want it to be. You want it to sit up and nice and high on the chest so that it's not impeding any movement when walking. Often you'll see out in the world that when dogs have easy walks on, they're sitting really, really low like this. And this, imp this impedes their movement and can actually cause damage to the dog. Um, so you want to sit nice and high up here. If it's not sitting high up, then you need to tighten one of the straps. Sometimes volunteers, staff, people in the world will put the easy walk on backwards. 
It is meant to have the active loop here on the front chest and to have the leash clipped here. It's not meant to have this on the back. Um, so you want this right here. You can clip this portion to any collar um, and then you're good to go. This is another no pull harness we use here at the shelter. This is called a sensation harness. Um, this is very similar in style to the easy walk, but it does not have the active loop on the front. Um, so I'm gonna, this is already fit for this dog and I will show you how to put it on him. All right, so with the sensation harness, you want to have the odd colored strap go under their belly and the um, circular ring is gonna be on their chest. So you'll place it over the dog's head so that the ring is here, odd colored strap is here. You will then clip it under their belly. The most common harness we use here at the shelter, especially for big dogs, is the Freedom Harness. So that is the burgundy colored harness that Nate's wearing here. I'm gonna show you how to take it on and off. There we go. <laughs> All right, so these harnesses are really great. They have a velour strap that goes under the armpits and the belly for maximum comfort. Um, it's really great for our pity type dogs that have sensitive skin and their underarms. On the back, there is an active martingale loop. This will tighten if there's a leash attached to it um, to prevent any pulling. Additionally, there is a ring on the front that also prevents pulling by being on the front by the chest. All right, so let's put the freedom harness on me. What you're going to do is have this active loop holding it here. Nate, come here. Come on. <laughs> you can have a treat handy. Ask your dog to sit. That's usually the easiest way. Give them the treat because they deserve it. Then you're going to take, have the active loop on top and put it over the dog's head here on the front. Come here, bud. On the front, you're going to notice that there is a T-shape here and the velour strap will be hanging down by their legs. You'll put the T-shape under their belly and clip the velour straps to either side. You'll then see that there's a nice T-shape right here and the rest of the harness is all secure. The leash that we utilize with the Freedom Harness is called a European Double Lead. This leash has two ends that we clip to the harness. The first is clipped on the front of the harness and also clipped to a martingale collar for security. The other end is clipped to the back, the active loop that we talked about. And then you hold the leash and it clips to both. This helps to um, keep the dog secure as well as prevent them from pulling and walking and is really successful and also comfortable for our dogs here at the shelter. Any and all interactions with the shelter dog should be focused on reducing stress. Being in the shelter is already a stressful event for these animals, even if they came from the best of homes. While you're interacting with the dogs here at the shelter, please do not introduce them to any public people or their animals without a staff member's approval. We ask volunteers not to train any dogs during their stay here. We want to mentally stimulate them, but training and adding a lot of extra pressure to these dogs while they're here is not the goal. We ask you to keep your time with each dog about 20 minutes. This allows for the dogs to get out, go potty, spend some time decompressing, but also allow for multiple dogs to get out during your stay. It's kind of the sweet spot of time. So 20 minutes is the key. There's only one dog allowed in each yard during their time here at the shelter, unless a dog is kenneled with a doggy friend. If there are two dogs in a kennel, we typically ask you to grab a friend, a volunteer friend, and take the dog out with them. If you have any questions about this, please ask a staff member before taking out two dogs. All right, I'm going to show you how to take a dog in and out of a kennel in the best safe way for you and for the dog. So let's unlock the kennel. I know, you're so excited. You can hang the lock on the kennel door while the dog's not in it. What you'll want to do is have your slip lead handy 
you want to stick your fingers like this by the ring. This will allow you to tighten and loosen with ease, but also keep the loop nice and open while you get the dog out and have his head go through the leash. So you're going to stick your foot by the kennel door, open up the latch, and have your leash here. So as the dog comes out, he puts his head through the leash. So a big interaction here that sounds really simple but can be uh, create a safe or dangerous situation is how we interact with the dog hands-on, how we pet them, how we give them affection while they're here at the shelter. Because these are dogs you don't know, you want to err on the side of caution when interacting with them and really just be nice and gentle in our interaction. Um, so this is my personal dog. He's gonna you know, be rather affectionate with me, but he's a great example of just how you can generally interact. So when you're with the dog, you want to approach them from the side. You can pet them gently on their back. You can do three pets and then wait. If the dog moves away, they're generally done with the interaction. If they stay like Nate did, you can continue to pet them. You can get a little closer and continue to pet them. And then you can wait again. He again stayed, so he wanted more interaction. You want to avoid any heavy pounding on the butt. Sometimes people do this with bigger dogs or kind of thicker breed dogs and think they like that. We want to generally avoid that. Um, it can be equated with spanking or just an aversive interaction. Let's keep everything nice and slow and nice and gentle. When we do really rough pets, we are inputting a kind of chaotic energy into our interaction and that can sometimes overstimulate the dog. So just really slow, calm pets is the way to go. You want to avoid any petting of the head and face because sometimes dogs can be sensitive in those areas, especially if they don't know us. Um, you don't want to reach over a dog's head to greet. If anything, you can do a little bit of a chest pet. But once again, you want to take a pause and see if they're actually enjoying, enjoying the interaction as you're doing so. So when you're going to greet a dog, um, let's treat every dog here, even if you interacted with them before, as a dog you do not know. A lot of people have this misconception that sticking your hand out is a great way to greet a dog. This actually ends up kind of giving a target to the dog, and if they're uncomfortable, it really just says, bite me here. So we really want to avoid that sort of interaction. When greeting a dog, you want to approach the dog and generally be next to them and say, hey buddy. You want to have them approach you instead of you approaching them. If you call the dog and they're not interested in interacting, that's okay. They just don't want to interact at that time. You want to still pet the dog really gently, like I showed you in the previous video. You don't ever want to approach like this. Another tip or trick is no physical play with the dogs. This can allow them to overstimulate and end up getting jumpy or mouthy or making poor behavior choices. Let's keep our time with the dogs nice and calm and play appropriately with them. Do not take any item directly away from the dog. This may be a toy, a treat, or even a stolen item. While dogs are in the shelter, they're under a lot more stress than the average home. Sometimes taking this toy or treat away can um, start a resource guarding behavior that the dog may do in the shelter. This can be unsafe for you and for the dog. The best thing to do is always trade the dog for the item or ask a staff member for help. All right, so we're gonna put Brewster back in his kennel. So I left the kennel door cracked so I know what door it is. Come on, Brewster. Sometimes dogs are reluctant to You can grab a fun toy. Brewster, come on. Sometimes that doesn't work. You can also grab treats. Brewster. Oh, and you can utilize a treat to walk them into their kennel. You'll then want to prop the door and hold it with one hand while you're taking the leash off of the dog in the other hand. You can toss some treats. Brewster. and then exit the kennel. Make sure you are locking up the kennel after you close it. A great thing to do is to give the dog a treat when they're in their kennel. 
after you've taken them out. This reminds the dogs that the kennel's not so bad. It doesn't mean the fun ended. It's just until next time. Right, buddy? We know you guys are so excited to spend time at the shelter and with our shelter dogs. While you're here at the shelter, you're allowed to take photos and videos of adoptable dogs. Those that are not up for adoption, we ask that you wait until they are up for adoption before sharing them with the world. If you're going to post an adoptable dog on social media, please use it for your own personal use, not for shelter promotion. Each dog has their own behavior and medical stipulations that will help to find them the right forever home. If we have volunteers posting information about the dogs that might be contradictory towards what the staff members are saying, it creates a lot of confusion. So if you're going to post an adoptable animal, that's totally fine, but please direct any questions or inquiries towards shelter staff. If there are not a lot of dogs at the shelter, you can always help out the shelter staff in other ways. One way to do this is through laundry or dishes. If you find yourself looking for something to do, you can always ask a staff member if there's anything you can assist with. Hey guys, my name is Tammy and I am Animal Care. I'm going to take you on a little journey here on how to do laundry and some dishes. And the first thing I want to say before I start showing you is thank you for taking on those tasks. Because as you see, if you guys didn't step up and do that for us, the Animal Care would have to do that. And with all the other things we're doing, it's a tremendous help. And uh, I'll show you how to get started on some laundry. Okay. So this is the laundry room, and the first thing you're going to do, uh, you're going to be handling um, clean laundry. So you don't have to wear gloves, but you can. It's good to get in the habit of wearing gloves. Those are located right up here, and you just put them on. The one key that you want to remember is after you handle the clean laundry is to take off, uh, I mean, after you've handled dirty laundry, if you're going to handle any clean laundry, you want to take off those gloves. But the best way to do it is if you can, handle all clean laundry first and then go to the dirty laundry. So I'm going to come in. The dryer's full. It's all done. This box up here is flashing done, so it tells you. Let's pull the door open. We have this crate on wheels here that's for clean, la clean laundry only. So that all this stuff can go in there. Anything that happens to fall on the ground, you want to just pick up and put into the green bin because at that point it's considered dirty again. So there's Hello, a Ronnie. couple of these um, white balls floating around in the dryer and they are to help with static cling. So if you come across them, you can just toss it back in there. Okay. So now I'm going to fold this laundry up. So there's a table on the wall over here that will fold down. And you can see there's shelves in the laundry room and there's a pattern to it. And you can see some of the shelves are labeled. So I'm going to fold up Everything that's in here, you can use this table. You can stack things up and then put it away. Some people like to put stuff away one piece at a time. It's whatever works for you. Um, toys. There's a crate, a couple of crates. One's for dog toys, leashes and collars, cat toys, and whatever you come across. So what I usually do is I'll make, fold them up, put them in their perspective piles until the pile gets too big. And then I'll go put them onto the shelf. And again, if anything touches the floor, you want to go ahead and throw it back into the dirty clothes bin so that we don't spread anything. And then when you're done with the table, you can fold it back up. Just a FYI, make sure you're holding it flat before you slide that thing because if that thing doesn't go in and you let go, um, it doesn't feel good, let me just tell you that. <laughs> so now I have my gloves on still. The washing machines are ready to um, empty. This one will tell you when it's ready. It says waiting to unload. 
So to unload it, you're gonna push this black button and you can hear a little noise and then you push this here. You'll hear it click and you can open it. And then we have laundry baskets down on the floor. You just take everything out of here. And these, these washers are a pretty big capacity. So you can fill them pretty full. My rule of thumb is almost to the top of the, the rim. You wanna be careful of your back when you um, are lifting the clean laundry from the washer because it's wet and it's heavy. Another thing to remember, make it a lot easier on you, is leave the dryer open when you're ready. Right. This is a good example. So this fell on the ground, so I'm gonna go ahead and just toss it in the big green bin, which is dirty stuff. The dryer will hold two loads, and then that way we're, wa we're not wasting energy on one load at a time. All right, and then for the dryer, you just close the door. For the dryer, we're supposed to empty the uh, uh, lint trap before every use. So to empty the lint trap, these guys turn, and then it just swaps like this. The lint trap's right under here. Okay. And there's a trash can right here. It puts the fan. And then there's two runners. There's a runner here and a runner there. And you just place it in there. Okay. To start the dryer, there's start and stop. And you obviously just push start. And it does its own thing. And in about 50 minutes, it'll stop. Clothes will be dry ready to fold and put away. So now that I've got all that done, so my hands are dirty again, so now I'm going to take the dirty laundry, which is in this big green bin, and I'm going to kind of slide it here a little bit. So when you take the dirty laundry, just take one piece at a time, kind of shake it out. We try really hard to get the cat litter and all the dog stuff and everything out of it before it goes into this bin. But just to be safe, and that's the reason why you always want to be wearing gloves. Because you never know what you're going to pick up. If you come across a toy that's rubber, plastic, or metal, those go into the dish room because they'll melt, get caught, mess up the washer and dryer. There's also um, some cat toys where part of it could go in the wash, but there's a, they're on a plastic stick. So that needs to go through the dishwasher. So those, we go over into that the, uh, dishwashing area. Each one of these washers are a little bit different from each other. So this one, you close the door and then you pull the handle down. That's closed. This will say the number one. That means it's ready to go. All you do is push start. It does its thing, uh, 34 minutes it'll go off. When it's off, it'll be a double zero, so you'll know that it's not ready to go. And it'll, I'll go through all these um, cycles right here before it shuts off. With these washers, you don't have to worry about adding soap or bleach. It's all automatic, and it, it gets pumped in, so there's no, no worries about that. Okay, so I'm going to call that one a done deal because it's got enough room to make it spin. So when you close this door, just because I learned the hard way, I usually put my right hand behind my back and close it with my left hand because it really hurts if you get one of these stuck in there. So you just make sure everything's out of the way. Give it a close. There's a yellow light button. Push that and the number one. It'll say run formula and it starts. So you're good to go. You've got 34 minutes on that one and about a half hour on this one. 
Um, and then what I will do, if everything's folded, got these going, then I will go and do some dishes uh, because I'll have enough time to get a few loads of dishes done. And then I might have extra time, then I can come back and fold. Uh, yeah, that's the laundry. Hey guys, it's Tammy again. Um, now I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the dishes. So this is the dish room. We have the sink, as you can see, we have a, a sanitizer. This isn't a dishwasher, but it's a sanitizer. So we still have to do a little bit of the dirty work, um, you know, washing out the dishes. Uh, and then instead of drying them, we put them into the sanitizer. It gives it an extra shot of cleanness. Um, and then uh, we don't, well, we do dry some of the dishes, but for the most part, we let it air dry. So there's that. But um, anyway, so when I come in to do dishes, we have gloves up here. There's some uh, scrubbers here. I just automatically grab some gloves. I do dishes. Um, so there's like two categories as in, in my mind. So we have all the things that will go in a dog or a cat's mouth, um, food, food dishes, toys, water dishes, and then things that are used for other things, i.e. cat boxes. So I do all the uh, to uh, toys, dishes, things that will go in their mouths first, and then I'll do the litter boxes. And what I do is, so we have a, a bin here that people stack dirty dishes, kitty litter boxes and stuff that we go through. Uh, I usually separate the kitty litter boxes from all the dishes that I'm gonna do. So, um, I'll have them all stacked up here. Got my kitty litter boxes down there. We have a drain plug. So you want to put that in. It just goes in the sink, just like you have at home. All right, and then we have soap that's located usually down here. It has a little spout on it. I usually put two pretty good wax in there. And then you take this off. You don't ever have to deal with this. This is just always on. It's adjusted. There's no worries about that. Um, we do have uh, plastic aprons if you want to wear those because you can get wet doing dishes. If you don't mind, then you don't have to. Um, I usually don't, but it's up to you. So you're going to want to stand back a little bit because it'll usually spray. You just fill the sink up. Okay, so once the sink gets full, I'll take my dishes and put a few in there and let them start soaking a little bit. We have these two plastic containers. You can read on there. One says litter box sponge. One says dish and toy sponge. The way I do it is I'm going to do the litter boxes last. So I'm going to take this litter box one and just move it out of the way so I don't accidentally grab something by mistake out of there. All right. Just put a squirt of soap in there. And you don't need to fill these up. You just want to get it so it's soaked up a little bit. So you have soap on your scrub, uh, scrub pad. All right. I take it, wash out the dish really well. The dog and cat food um, dishes is good to kind of take a second look at because sometimes that food, the wet food, really sticks on there good. Okay, let me take this off. Just give it a quick little rinse. Take a look at it. Everything's out of there. It's clean. So I set up here. And I'll keep going. Toys, same thing. Those go in the dog's mouth, so we'll still use the dish. Rinse it off. Okay, then after you have your, as much as you can do, they're all over here. This tray that's in the dishwasher. slide out or you can leave it in it depends Every, everybody does that a little differently it's just your choice and then you just put your dishes in sometimes these guys get water in there too so you can leave it out and sometimes they don't fit in exactly but as long as they're in there 
So we have these for the dogs, Kongs, that we stuff with peanut butter. Sometimes they're a little bit hard to get stuff out of. So I usually have, we have this bucket here and I will take the Kongs, put them in there and I'll put a squirt or two of soap in there and then I'll take the uh, hose and I'll hold it down. You don't want to pull too hard, but just you can get it in there. And then you fill that up to cover the toys. And you can let those soak because it'll be it'll make it much easier when you go to uh, wash them. And once you have this full, this can hold quite a bit, but you don't want to over stuff it obviously, kind of like you do at home when you're on dishes in your dishwasher. So you want to make sure the water can circulate and sanitize and clean them. When you get that all full, slide it back through here. This will have been turned on, the sanitizer will have been turned on. Usually the first animal care person that's here turns it on. So it's all ready to go. You just make sure that's in there. You just take this, pull it down. Remember the power of I don't know. It's okay not to know information while you're here at the shelter. That's what staff are here for. Whether it's a protocol or procedure or an interaction you've had with an animal, please ask a staff member before doing 